This podcast contains swear words. Hello, and welcome to Talking Shit with Tara Cheyenne, a podcast about art making, creativity, not giving up, even though you kind of feel like it, but please don't, we need you, and living well in the process. I am coming from the perspective of a performing artist, but the themes and issues discussed here apply to all of us. Whether you consider yourself an artist or not, life is a creative act. I'm your host, Tara Cheyenne Friedenberg, a choreographer, actor, dancer, writer, and educator living on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations on the west coast of Turtle Island. Today on the podcast, I am returning to one of my favorite interview guests, Justine A. Chambers. And if you have not listened to my previous interviews with this wonderful human being and amazing artist, you can go back to episode 13 and then episode 19 and then come to this episode or listen to them out of order. It could be really interesting. We started talking in episode 13 near the beginning of the pandemic. And it is also so fascinating to hear how we have changed. What are the things that were most important to us at different phases of this extraordinary time? And in this interview, Justine and I go deep into what it means to really support artists with kids. It doesn't just mean, you know, letting somebody leave to go pick up their kid from school. What do we really mean when we mean we are supporting people who are caregivers? What is dramaturgy and dance? What is being an outside eye? What is being an advisor? Justine has some excellent thoughts on these ideas and how we can implement them with sensitivity and awareness. A room of one's own. Virginia Woolf said it. Justine has some thoughts. And how we develop our own practices, what it is to practice our practice and how to say no, or at least not say yes right away. I think you're going to really enjoy this interview. And as usual, a little reminder to please rate, review, subscribe. Word of mouth is great, too. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Talking shit with Tara Cheyenne. Oh, my God. It's so interesting. Tara talks to so many interesting artists with so many amazing ideas. You're going to get a lot out of it. And if you have the means and inclination, donations are very, very welcome. You can go to terrashine.com, upper right-hand corner, click Donate. It'll take you right there. Or we will put the link in the show notes. Thank you in advance. And just giving a shout out to my friend, the composer, sound designer, imaginer, Nancy Tam, who I interviewed in episode 28, their performance Walking at Night by Myself, which they talk about in episode 28, super exciting, will be live October 29th, 2021, here on the West Coast. Go over to nantam.ca, N-A-N-T-A-M.ca for the information on that exciting performance. Mm, I love our community. And now, my interview with Justine A. Chambers, Chapter 3. So, Justine A. Chambers, how the hell are you? I think I'm pretty good. I mean, I say I think because I feel like that's something that shifts so um, quickly or violently. Yes. Or unexpectedly. But I would say like the past couple weeks, I felt pretty, pretty pretty good for the most part. I mean, I feel somehow more relaxed because of some of the government structures put in place around COVID. Yes. That created a sense of relaxation for me. On the other hand, uh, my kid is in school and he is under the age of 12. So I also have some concerns about all those little bodies together. 
and the fact that teachers aren't required to be vaccinated. Yeah. There are my politics laid out pretty clearly. <laughs> uh, so I do have some concerns about that. So there's that thing where like the new, like the vaccination, proof of vaccination gives me like a sense, maybe not the fact that people are getting vaccinated, but that the government is actually caring <laughs> in a different way. That makes me feel good. Yeah. I have like moved into like a very different life structure this September. So, and I'm enjoying it very much so far. So that's nice. Um, I have an office and that feels like meta from heaven uh, <laughs> to have somewhere to go and close a door. Virginia Woolf, a room of one's own. Right. Instead of, you know, going to the bathroom to have a private conversation or <laughs> attempting to write an email in between requests to like pull the, the, the hand out of the transformer when it's, you know, when you're trying to make it a robot. Yes. You know, like just the, like a, a bit of privacy. I realized there has been none of that for two years. It feels like however long it's been 30 years that we've been in this pandemic. <laughs> I've had zero privacy. <laughs> I think as we're pushing 35 years of pandemic now, I yeah. think we might be. Uh, so I, I think, I think, you know, some of these shifts are really nice. Um, like the larger societal governmental shifts are nice. And this life shift where I'm sort of out of the hustle feels really, really nice. I'm not going to lie. Right. Absolutely. I feel like that is... And just for people's context, Justine is now teaching at SFU. So you're teaching a suite of courses. Yes. So your life has shifted. And I guess that word hustle is so, it's so loaded. I mean, I know people who are like, yeah, the hustle, they're into it. Uh, There's a point at which I think there's a tipping point. I don't know that I've ever been into it where it no longer sounds like a good idea. It sounds just like, ugh. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, I was really into it for a long time. Um, I maybe wasn't into the way I felt all the time, but I was definitely into being like busy and wanted and sought after and producing and visible. Um, but there came a moment where it's, it was so clearly unsustainable for me and like emotionally unsustainable. Yeah. Especially like once Max was born. And I feel like once Max was born, like the hustle got more intense because all of a sudden things were really getting busier. And I was on the road with my own work and with my baby and my own work and not knowing that I couldn't handle it, but just doing it anyway, Mm. continuing because that's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to want to tour all over the world and you're supposed to want, you know, um, you know, I had to like really be honest about the fact that it wasn't working for me. I was not well, like I was feeling lousy all the time and like constantly wondering if I was dying from something. Yeah. But not having the time to actually go to the doctor. <laughs> you know? um, I couldn't keep doing it. And I think more importantly, as like from an artistic perspective, like I just can't be producing all the time and feel like I have anything to say. Like I quite literally may have run out the things to say about four years ago, but I kept trying to say something, right? Then you're just taking up space in a way that maybe is not necessary. I don't know. I mean, I have no perspective, obviously, on how I take up space or not. None of us truly really do, but no. I just needed some time to like be in practice and be with people, you know, and like, I'm not one of those people. I'm not like you, Tara, like you can go into a room and work alone really hard on something by yourself for hours. Like I can't do that. I have a nap. I start watching Netflix on my phone. Like I do not have the rigor to be alone in a space. And for me, it's so dynamic to be like, I only make when I can be in relationship or have somebody, which is why I force people to come be in a room with me. If I'm going to work on something that's requires me to be alone. I just, I quite simply can't stay with it. So there's something about being, you know, with a group of people and just working on practice, which essentially is all I feel like I'm doing here so far teaching. We'll see. I'm sure other things will rear their ugly or beautiful heads, but it's just nice not to be churning it out. It's nice not to be filling every nanosecond of my life for fear that I will not have enough money. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, it's not that I haven't had enough money to live. I just am stuck with that feeling of being 22 and making bread and water into bread in the oven. Yeah. 
I hold all of that sort of scarcity with me. You know, I also have extreme ways of not being (laughs) in a scarcity mentality, as we all know. But yeah, I feel like there's something about holding onto that idea that if I don't do everything, if I'm not everywhere, people are going to forget me and they're not going to want me around anymore. It's like so base, right? Yeah. It's like just little kid shit. It's just like goes back to being in grade two and wanting to be at all the play dates and all the birthday parties and all the events because you don't want to have missed out and be forgotten. You know, once I kind of realized that what was driving me, Mm -hmm. you know, I am not six or seven anymore. More at 40 years to that. uh, I would hope that at this point I could have enough sense of resolve with myself that I, I, I can not be places and still know that the things I have to do or I want to do have value somewhere. But yeah, the gigging business, whoa. Listen to that, I just coughed like a pariah, <laughs> like a pariah. Everyone's like, does she have COVID? I know, you can't sneeze or cough without, or have a hot flash. No, because then you might have a fever and still have COVID. Oh, yummy, middle age. <laughs> no night sweats for me. Oh my <laughs> God, very menopause. Yay. Mm-hmm. So I think there is something about being out of that feeling like I have to do everything or take everything, but instead being sort of part of a community where I have to show up. I mean, I go to the same place every day. Oh, that just sounds delicious. When is the last time I did that? Right. You know? Yeah. And I have a regular schedule. And that's not to say there aren't other things I'm doing around this work, but it's just nice to know that this is my primary focus in a way for the moment. Yeah, exactly. There's something about a singularity of focus that I feel like as a creator is so liberating, so generative too. And that we don't, in the gigging hustle, hustle, hustle ways, that we don't have a lot of that. It's so fragmented. You're just like popping from one thing to the other and all the energy it takes to like restart at every, every time it's like, oh, we're, what? Okay. We're working on this thing. Okay. Yeah. So all that energy. So there's something about, and I wonder if this is valuable for folks who are even, you know, younger and still in like, I've got, I'm working on four different pieces and I'm teaching over here and blah, blah, blah. That there's something about like structure of time of finding any little ways of sameness from day to day. So there's some sense of relaxation or containment in how you're, you're practicing. Yeah. I mean, what I find now is just even, you know, in the last two weeks, there have been, I mean, I'm still working on other things outside of this space, you know, but there have been a few asks like, oh, could you do this? And I just say no immediately, you know, whereas before my brain, they'd ask me and my brain's like, hell no. And my mouth goes, let me see what I can do. And I'm like, literally, this is pathological behavior. Oh God. Yeah. And then because I don't have fixed things or I don't consider my life fixed, or it's supposed to be able to be fluid or, you know, before the September that I would always find ways, like I would twist myself into knots to find ways to do things that maybe weren't that important to me. Yeah. But now I'm not saying yes right away or, and then I'm looking at my reality and how I want to pick my kid up from school every day and hang out on the soccer field while him and his buddies play. And that I'm somehow having a much better time prioritizing how I'm going to use my time and energy in a way that I've just not been able to do my entire life, basically, until now, unless I got sick or had a massive burnout and had like, you know, when I was like fainting and stuff, you know, (laughs) those would be, it would take a crisis for me to be mindful of my own time and energy. And for some reason, probably because I'm being paid in a way that I haven't been before, because I feel incredibly privileged, you know, all of these things, I'm just doing a much better job of prioritizing my time and energy. I mean, I found this something on Instagram. I don't know who wrote it, but I sent it to Kate the other day our friend Kate Franklin, and it said, adulthood is saying, but after this week, things will slow down a bit over and over until you die. Oh. Quite honestly, <laughs> hard truth my entire adult life. And yeah, I would really like that to not be my hard truth. Absolutely. You know, I would like to say, oh, actually next week is more open and more fluid. And I'm going to keep it like that as opposed to like, because it's open, I'm going to fill a gap. You know, maybe I'm, I'm growing up a tiny bit by like taking better care of my time, energy, and desires. Perhaps we'll see. Talk to me in three weeks. We'll see if I've held on to it. (laughs) We'll come back for another, you know. Country checkup. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Cross Justine checkup. Um, (laughs) The Steen files. My child, when he was very young, called Justine Steen. 
And that is just stuck, stuck. now. <laughs> steam. steam, steam, which is a little bit, you know, a little bit steam. We like it. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about when we're little and we don't want to miss out on the play dates and stuff. Don't you feel like it's reinforced all the way along the line, especially in in our industry? It's like you take every gig. Don't say no because they're not going to come back and ask you again. Uh oh. Yeah you know, the pressure to be the person who's always saying yes. And I mean, I don't know about you, but definitely from my mother, grandmother, back and back, there's this fear of the bag lady. It's like, if I don't, I'm going to be a bag lady for sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's funny. Um, because also we're like totally privileged people. Yeah. I don't think my family would let me become a bag lady. Certainly not, nor would mine. Right. But I feel like it comes down through the generations. And of course, probably not that many back. It was a reality, but it's not now. So how do you let go of that? I mean, I think mine is so attached to excellence, right? Like being better than. Yeah. Knowing that I have to be like, from my perspective, it's a racialized thing, right? It's like you have to be a thousand times cleaner, more fashionable, smarter, more creative. Like there's like all this extreme excellence yes. that has to occur. I feel like my parents were very much, you know, you get 98% and then it's like, well, where's the other 2%, right? Like mm -hmm. there's that, like my, my sister and I have talked about it. Like we both are hyper overachievers, like to our detriment, right? Yeah, yeah. But then all this like focus on being successful and being able to be like an adult in the world who can take care of themselves and like being self-sufficient and resilience and knowing that there's always something you can do to continue and to be better, which could be interpreted in many ways as like such a great thing to say to your children that like you can do so many things, but it also can be like misinterpreted and depending on what kind of attention is attached to it can be really destructive you know, but at the same time, like I, I remember being a kid and saying like, oh, I want to go play with so-and-so. I want to go out. My mom's like, you just need to be still for a while. Ooh. Right. And my mother is like the queen of relaxation in so many ways. And it was like, you know, I wanted to go do it or I wanted to take this class and this class and this class and this class. She's like, no, you can do one class. You just need to like, you need to play. Mm. You don't need to be that busy. Yeah. Right. So it's a funny thing. Like you're getting, these are like very mixed messages and that's why I'm obsessed with sleeping, I think. Like I'm obsessed with sleeping and resting, but I don't do either of those particularly well. Although I have to admit, admit the other day I was in my office eating my lunch and I was watching Making the Cut. Oh yeah. With Heidi Klum and Tim Gunn <laughs> for 15 minutes while I ate my lunch. And I was like, look at me relax. I felt really good about that. That giant 15 minutes. That giant 15 minutes. But you know. Oof, take it easy. <laughs> the hyper relaxation mode. But yeah, I, you know, and I just would like to think that I'm like having some sort of emotional, like even evolving emotionally to like know that I'm good enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I think part of that busyness of doing more is like needing more and more and more validation that I'm enough or I'm good enough or I'm great or, and I'm just trying to like settle into the fact my, my therapist who I love so desperately um, <laughs> told me the last time I spoke to her, I was in my office having my session with her, <laughs> with them. And they told me to sit in my throne and I'm really trying hard to sit in my throne. Oh Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. Interestingly, a therapist I went to once and then ditched because she said to me, you're still dancing as if, <laughs> you know, old lady. Anyway, but she did say one good thing. She said, for female identifying people, you have the virgin, the whore, the mother, and the crone. Yep. Between mother and crone, there's this massive chasm of nothing. <laughs> yep. But what's missing is the queen. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, damn. And anytime you do see in popular culture the queen, it's like the evil queen in Sleeping Beauty or something like that. Right. So it's like, oh, I don't want to be that one. Bring back the throne. Bring back the throne. I'm sitting in my throne right now with my foot on my desk. <laughs> I love it. It's work to do it. It's work to hold on to that. Yeah, constantly, daily. All right. I'm going to hit you with a question now. Hit me. You and I were talking about this the other day. And when I say other day, it could be a month ago. It could be two months ago. It could be a couple of years ago. I don't know. It could be yesterday. Yep. I don't know. Time's just right now. The idea of dramaturgy. So you and I had a conversation about dramaturgy and dance, how it's maybe not quite understood or it's understood in ways that could be problematic or 
not as effective. And I'm really interested in that question and how you view dramaturgy in dance. I don't think I know what it is. Like, if I'm going to be really honest, I could say a bunch of things that make me sound like I know something. (laughs) I mean, what I can talk about is like my relationship to, in recent months, to this idea of dance dramaturgy and how, I think we were talking about how loosely that term is flung around. Yeah. Certainly maybe dramaturgy in theater has been more well-established and maybe only in the last, I don't know, 20 years. It's like, and even this could be, I don't know what I'm talking about. Oh my God. But this is how I perceive it. That that word started to show up in dance incrementally over the last 20 years. And there are fields of study, places you can go and you can study that. But I actually don't know what they're studying in those rooms. If I'm going to be really honest, like, I don't know. I've not been in those rooms. I have no idea. But what I found is that it's a term that is used too loosely, potentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And without, even within the, the project itself, there's no discussion about defining what that means. You know, I have run into trouble with being called a dramaturg when I don't feel like I'm fulfilling that role because I don't actually know what that is these days or any days. I mean, I don't know. I have ideas about the job of the dramaturg and it being like as equal or as a, a player as any of the performers in the room or any of the devisors in the room and that it's, you know, inextricably woven into the fabric of the work or the devising process, mm-hmm. the words you know, for lack of other words, dramatic arcs or character development, or I guess what I've been worried about is, first of all, knowing that my work is totally not dramaturgical in any way. Like, (laughs) I don't think about that when I'm making work. I don't think, um, maybe there's a dramaturg would say to me, oh, no, absolutely, this is happening, this is happening. But And so that when I'm invited into work to be someone's, what I perceive as maybe an artistic advisor or an outside eye, or just someone to reflect back what they're seeing, Mm -hmm. that this uh, has been given a term of dramaturg, which I am not. And then from a maybe external perspective, people see you attached to work and feel like you were a part of making it when in fact you weren't. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm just speaking from my personal experience of the last six months, things that have come up where I'm like, oh yeah, no, 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 I did not take that role in the work, you know? But I also think that saying you have a dramaturg is a way to also validate the seriousness or the commitment of artists to the work they're making, Mm -hmm. or it makes it feel more uh, valuable or what have you. So, I mean, I know there are like a number of people, I think about like Geek Cools is somebody who works as a dance dramaturg, you know, or I think about, I mean, there's a number of people, I guess, who do that work, but it's not something I feel like I'm good at, but I feel like I'm useful in a space to reflect back what I'm seeing or ask questions, but that's not dramaturgical role as far as I understand it. Yeah. It's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, I've worked with quite a few dramaturges, if that is the plural of dramaturge. I don't even know if it is. Dramaturgi. <laughs> yes, I like that better. <laughs> right? And uh, in my experience, each individual kind of approaches it in a completely different way. And I think it's maybe easier, big air quotes, in theater because of the structures already and because of the history of dramaturgy in theater. Yeah. But when we move it to dance, it's not the same. There's similarities, but then the whole idea of how we define it, I think it's a super interesting question. But the thing, perhaps with no answers, because a lot of questions don't have any answers. As I get older, this is what I'm discovering this. Um, but there's something about defining these roles at the onset how important that is in, um, are you listening, young choreographers and creators and everybody? At the beginning, defining, like, what are the expectations? What do you need? And to keep circling back, because you might need just somebody to reflect what you're doing week one. And week two (laughs) might be, I really need somebody to monitor the, the energetic ebb and flow of what's happening or, you know, whatever else. Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a big thing in general, you know, thinking about how we're deciding to work together. We do need to take time to be all in alignment about what's happening in the room so that we're not making assumptions, right? Or we're not taking people or ideas or processes for granted. Because I could go into a room 
thinking I'm doing one thing and someone's perceiving it as another. So even the words I say, the meaning changes for that person if they think I'm in a different role. It's like you said, spend some time outlining everyone's expectations or understandings so that you are coming from a, a, like a shared understanding of the work you're doing together. And then this is where things like community agreements, we see more and more of start to become living documents, not this, you know, some fixed static thing that can't change. Um, because if you think about how much a work changes from inception to sharing it with the public as a finished or, you know, semi-finished thing, I think that even how we work on the work, it needs to reflect the fact that it's an ever-changing process. Oh yeah, hundred percent. It makes me think of, just because I'm in the throes of grant writing right now, that the possibly hilariousness of going back when you're well on your way to making something, going back to read what you wrote in the application. Oh my God. Yeah. And just like the expectation. Oh, seriously. But at the time, that's a good idea. I'm going to go with this, but yeah, like things just, they're going to morph. They should morph. They should change. They should be alive. And I think we do get into trouble, whether it's with our relationships in making and with the actual work itself, when we expect it to, to be fixed, be, be the thing that we said we were going to do or the relationship we said we were going to have. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's unrealistic, right? And then, and then do we start shoving the work into what we said it was going to be or let it be what it's becoming? And yeah, I would hope that we can be with it in its present form, whatever that is. And then, you know, and then your support structures, whether that's a dramaturg or an outside eye or someone to reflect back thoughts and ideas, you want to include them in those changes, right? So it's also about keeping everybody um, in the know, like this is what it's become now. This is what it's becoming now. This part is no longer useful to us. We're going to drop it so that, you know, whoever is in your support system for making or part of your creative team knows what's no longer on the table. Because sometimes that happens too, right? Where it's like, well, I thought you were working on that. Oh, no, we're not doing that anymore. And it changes the lens, right, from with which people are trying to make sense or experience what's happening. Yeah, absolutely. The argument for the check-in, and I would even go further than the check-in and say like the argument for a good kibbutz, like a good chin wag, you know, that time to really be with each other and to talk about just how everybody's doing in the process. And that's when we learn how things are changing and thoughts are changing and, oh, the way I'm approaching this is changing. And now I think it's a this. And what do you think? And under these, you got to do it now. You got to do it fast. You got to do it in two weeks and then premiere. Yeah. It doesn't allow for all that really important space and exchange. I do want to talk about the check-in though. Talk about the check-in. I don't like check-ins. Okay. Okay. (laughs) And I'm going to explain to you why I think I don't like them. Um, The other day I was in a taxi with Zara and we were talking about check-in. And part of the reason I don't like, always like, sometimes they're fine. Um, I prefer like just to allow conversation to erupt as we're working and those become ways of being with where we are. Mm. But, you know, check-ins really work for a lot of people. So I'm not like disparaging of it as a form. Like I'm just talking for myself. I feel there's an expectation for me to divulge things that I don't want to divulge. Yeah. I know you can say pass, but that also feels loaded to me. Like it doesn't feel that open a thing to me, even though like, no, anybody can do what they want. (laughs) And I'm like, and Zara said this genius thing, because as we know, Zara Shabab is a genius human. Yeah, for long. She said, you know, I spent my whole morning packaging all of that shit up so I could come here and work and I don't want to undo it. Ooh. And I think that is exactly how I feel. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Often, because I don't particularly think any space is a safe space. I don't particularly think that me unloading something again for some people it really really works and I just think for me personally there is something about what I need to hold on to and hold for myself is what allows me to work and like sharing it with others does not allow me to work necessarily I also feel like there's some expectation to have some big emotional outpouring that I may not have access to but also I felt like quite oppressed and check-in circles. Yeah. So 
I feel like there could be other forms of checking in. I guess I'm always looking for like how many ways sharing that information can arise. And sometimes when I just arrive somewhere, like I don't have it in me to go into everything that I'm feeling. And it's not about compartmentalization either. It's not like I want to put that on the shelf to be here, but some things are just for me to hold. And I know there's someone's going to be listening saying, well, then you can just pass. But I don't feel that the check-in comes without expectations. Also, sometimes I feel like I want to support the people I'm in the room with. And if someone is having a really hard and terrible time, I just want to like hold them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) And then I don't know when to stop holding them. And this is all my own shit. I'm not saying this is like a universal or this is a way, but I really struggle with the check-in. And a student of mine yesterday, who's a performance student, but, you know, theater training, said, you know, I'd really like it if we could have check-ins. And like my, I recoiled internally Mm. so deeply. And I said, yes, we can have a check-in, but can we not make it an hour-long check-in? Because I also feel like that eating of time creates stress for me. Yeah, absolutely. And not because I want to get on the stuff and do the work, but I, I'm aware that I think maybe this is similar for you. Like since I became a mom, time in the studio is just like, it's like time in this office. It's like mana, you know, mana from heaven, right? It's like, oh yeah, it's gold. It gives me such a sense of well being. Yeah. And it gives me such a sense of connection to the people I'm with. And I'm so grateful to be in those spaces with people that I want to hear everything about their lives. And that can come out in drips and drabs through the rehearsal process. We can also go hang out, but I just really value the time with the work because I don't have time in a way that I did before I was a mom. Yeah, I really relate to that. Totally. The work is the connection. Like for me. It is. And, and you know, like when you and I work together, we just talk about our lives the whole time. Exactly. And we work. <laughs> And we talk about their lives. And we work at the same time. I remember years ago, um, my director, Sophie Yendel, who directed my first few pieces, we would get in there and we would just chat. I mean, for me, that's the check-in. You just like, how's it going? You eat a little bit and you check in. And we would check in for like half an hour, 45 minutes. And then we'd always feel like, oh God, we're not working. And then what would happen was really interesting is that down the road, especially when we went to remount a piece for tour, we would realize that all those conversations were actually in the work. Of course. And we were working while we did it. I mean, maybe this speaks to that oppression of the formalized check-in. Yeah. It's almost an institutional thing. And anytime you're like, what's going on emotionally for you? With that accent, obviously. Of course. <laughs> it, immediately it's like, ooh, shut down, hot face. Oh no. That's what happens to me. It does shut me down though. It really does. And I think that exactly what you're saying, like separating the living from the working Uh or your lived life, your personal life from the artwork feels very antithetical to making artwork for me. So I, I think there's this thing where it's like, why can't just the conversations kind of slip out and then we get back into, not get back into working, we continue working with the information that came with our lives, right? The anecdotes, the frustrations, the like, oh, I'm feeling really like, I really want to do this for you this way, but I feel really insecure. You know, like all these things we say, yeah. so maybe it is about a little bit like separating those things and not letting them just be a part of making work. Mm-hmm. And I also guess, you know, and I have the deep privilege of working with the same people for so, so many years that I know they'll tell me if they're not okay. Yeah. <laughs> And I know that there's always space for that. And, you know, maybe some people need something more explicit, but I I feel like the people I work with and have worked with for the last 10 years, they will call me or text me or arrive. And, you know, I just remember this moment when we were working on family dinner and Allie came to rehearsal and we're on that, you know, we're at Kids Beach with that field house and she came in and she said, you know, my grandmother died today. And I was like, do you need to leave? She's like, no, I think I just need to sit by the water for a bit. She went and sat by the water for a bit and she came and she joined us Mm. because that's what she needed to do. Like she needed to be there as much as she needed to be separate from us, you know? And so it felt like her coming into the room later, was no big deal. Right. Right. So I guess it's like me not wanting to like partition that space off as a thing, because there's something about like, like you said, formalizing it, that makes me feel really uneasy because I guess checking in with myself emotionally and with other people it's not a formal thing. It's like a way of just being, you know, we spill out 
you know, I was talking to someone here and she was like, oh, my dog had diarrhea all night and I was cleaning it. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that is why she's tired today. And that is going to have something to do with the work she does for the rest of the day, but it wasn't separate from working. Yeah. And that could be the crux of it. And we'll probably have to do another podcast on that very thing. Yeah. The separation of self, of lived life, of everything, of the kids and the dogs and the, the diarrhea, obviously. Yeah, the diarrhea. Um, <laughs> From the work because it's there. I was having a conversation with Craig Hall, who's the artistic director of Vertigo Theater in Calgary, and we're working on this project together. And uh, that's finally going, you know, after being stalled from the pandemic. We're just so excited and just how he too is like, bring the kids and let it all be there because we we do do better work and it doesn't actually take longer. No. And we all feel like we're caring for the people we need to care for. We feel like they're caring for us. We're able to also be caregivers with each other because we're revealing those of us who are parents or caregivers to anybody in our lives. Mm -hmm. If those things can just be, then the care kind of permeates. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. I mean, if, if those things are included, then, then they're included and they're included by everyone. I think back to like, it must've been like summer of 2019. That was a hellish summer. Mm -hmm. I talk about the summer of like, I, I'm going to do absolutely everything so I can feel like total garbage. I remember that. But I went to Plug In Institute in Winnipeg with Natalie Hershwitz and Andrew Singh to like facilitate the summer institute. And before we went, I remember saying like, I'm going to have my kid with me. I will have at that point been on the road alone with him for four weeks. I'm going to be tired and I can't exclude him from what we're doing. I'm going to need like childcare and we're going to need a place that is like conducive to my child being present. And when I say these things on the inside of my body, I'm quaking and I'm feeling deeply on the defensive. Yes. But when I speak to people, I'm trying to be like, you know, if we could just, I'm trying to be like all nicey, nicey, smooth, smooth, make it smooth for me. How uncomfortable. But that was taken up so wholeheartedly by the two of them and the curator at Plugin, mm -hmm. Jennifer Paparo. It was just so fully taken up that I was going to arrive with my child that it created so much ease for me. And then I was able to arrive in the work with like an outrageous amount of energy and generosity. Yeah. Right? Someone picked us up from the airport. I didn't have to get in a cab with the car seat and fucking stroller. You know what I mean? Like, and then they drove us to the apartment. You know, we all shared, but it was a condo and it had two levels. Max and I had our own bedroom, but people could hang out downstairs. And there was a yard and one block away was a huge playground with a splash pad. And that's a game changer for all the parents out there. You know how important it is to have a playground really close. Oh, yeah. And they got me a sitter who was this young Indigenous artist who had a huge family who totally has brothers and sisters, understands. Wow. You know, it was like everything was so primed for me to be a parent in that space. Yeah that it completely changed my demeanor where maybe the project I was at before I was paying $22 an hour for childcare, which of course I have to say also that the lovely choreographer recently um, reimbursed me for that, which I thought was incredibly generous mm. and thoughtful, but I was so aware of the fact of like the inconvenience of my parenthood yeah. and how I was just kind of always upset about it. Like I was paying a ton for childcare. Yeah. I was living in the home of the choreographer and not wanting to like mess with their space and aware that my kid behavior could be off-putting. And this is not to say I wasn't fully welcomed and invited in, but there was something different about the parameters. And even Andrew and Natalie, they, they played with Max. Like we'd come back and I told them I'm only going to hang out for three hours a day yeah. in that space. Yeah. Um, but we would come back and then Andrew was teaching Max how to skip. So I could just like stare into space. When we arrived at the house, Andrew and Natalie had bought like kid snacks. So there was snacks as soon as we, you know, like amazing. There was just something really special about that being taken up, which then allowed me to do better work and be way more present and not feel like I was at some sort of disadvantage or that I was imposing difficulty on others. It felt so embraced, even by the participants in the Summer Institute. You know, one day Max couldn't handle another day with the sitter mm -hmm. and he just came in and he was like, I just want to be with you, mama. Aww. They were all like, go, bye, bye, bye. Like it was incredible. So there's something about making concessions for children and there's something about creating a culture of care where they're included. Those are slightly different things. I just had so much shit to come down to that one sentence. 
I love it. I love it. It's like this amazing funnel. It's amazing funnel. And then boom, 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 (laughs) gold, gold, take away, take away. (laughs) The quote, I feel like it's really valuable and super potent to talk about all those things holistically, like you just did, because it talks about, you know, being ourselves. And as artists, what are you making from? You're making from yourself. You're filtering this world and this experience and this you know, banana pants society we live in, we're filtering it through ourselves. And if we have to compartmentalize ourselves, it takes so much fucking energy oh my God. and money, as you point out. And I think that's really important. And it makes me think of, as I get super feminist, hello, I'm super feminist. I love super feminist. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> Isn't this all about hiding all the parts of ourselves that are, you know, female or femme or not the default, which is, you know, the white masculine, which is the parenting and the bleeding and the caring and the worrying, all of these things. And the idea that you have to hide it all. Oh, yeah. The hair removal, you know, like I could go on and on. Right. Oh, my God. The bleeding. Did I tell you? I'm not (laughs) going to tell you this story. We're doing a podcast. I'm not just talking to you. I'll tell you after you. (laughs) We'll do a separate podcast on artists about bleeding artists in midlife. <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about the dumbass hot flashes that, you know, 10 minutes before I turned 49, all of a sudden it's like hot flashes. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Oh my God. And the like unexpected periods in life. Yeah. I had a full 15 year old moment the other day oh. when I decided that I was going to wear all off white for the first time in my life. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That was like a, basically a spell for bleeding. Oh my God. Anyway. We'll have a separate. Listeners, look forward to that because we need to get that shit out of shame zone. <laughs> we do. And into, well, because I'm like 49 and oops, I forgot to lie about my age again. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> it would be so cool if people were talking about this. So I, I wasn't constantly going to the internet or books going like, is this a thing? You know? Oh yeah. Do you know what I always think of? Um, I think of that thing that you said Nigel Charnock does, which is he, he always tells people he's older than he is. So they tell him he looked great for his age. <laughs> he did that. Oh, just love that. The great and late Nigel Charnock, who was one of my mentors. Yeah. It was fucking brilliant. Because the first time I met him in 2008, he told me he was in his 50s. He was not in his 50s. <laughs> He was in his like mid early forties. And I was like, wow, you look amazing. And then later when we started working together, he was like, oh yeah, I completely lie about that. (laughs) So that people will go, oh, wow. You look amazing. You look amazing. I love that so much. I'm afraid of doing it because I'm afraid people will not be surprised. Yeah. You want them to say, oh my God, you look great for your age. Instead of being like, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) yeah, if you just go, oh yeah, oh yeah. And I'm just going to, you know, one more. I lie because it won't be one more super feminist moment, but also the for your age. I know, right? Go fuck yourself. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. Or the attractive older woman. Yeah. You know. Oh my God. I do. Yeah. It's so, it's so boring. And at the same time, it does a number on me. I know. Right? And that's so frustrating, you know? But I guess it takes no time to put something in place and it takes so much time to dismantle it. Even specifically within myself, I'm seeking so. Yes. And also, I think you and I both grew up in houses where beauty was a thing. Oh, yes. Oh, (laughs) oh, oh. Yeah. I like to go back to Kate Franklin speaking about, I think, her grandmother who said, no personal comments. No personal comments. Lammy. Lammy. Oh, she calls herself Lammy. It's just too good. I know. I've read this in two different ways. Your appearance is the least interesting thing about you. And also I've read it as your weight is the least interesting thing about you. And I feel like Mm. it's like, wow, yeah. That as a mostly female identifying person, depending on the time of the day, Mm -hmm. um, those are really potent, those two sentences. Like, oh yeah, wow. I could like actually get some shit done. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and it is the least interesting thing about most people, how they look. But on that note, not to objectify you, but you are gorgeous. Oh, thank you, doll. I'm going to say just thank you. I'm learning how not to deflect compliments in my middle age. Thank you so much. That is very kind. And I accept that with great love and gratitude. (laughs) Yay. I am going to finish with one more question, Mm -hmm. but we could talk for hours and hours, obviously. Of course. And we'll do another one because you got to have the Steen files. (laughs) 
this week on the Steam Files. Uh, Is there something, and it can be as small or large or inconsequential, can be just something that's really working for you these days or this week or today? Um, this shouldn't be such a hard question to answer. <laughs> what's working for me? You know what's working for me right now for the first time, probably since Max was born. I'm dancing every fucking day and it's working for me. <gasps> I feel great. Like I feel emotional about how great it is to dance every day and how much I took it for granted. Yeah. To be in like in my body, in practice, talking about like, I feel like I'm getting to know my body again because I didn't have a chance after my son was born because I was busy trying to be the best at everything and gently failing at everything at the same time, which is probably unbelievably productive. Yeah. Dancing every day is really working for me. It's been like two and a half weeks of dancing every day. I don't think I've gone two and a half weeks of dancing every day since before I was pregnant. Because once I got pregnant, I just like really just didn't want to do anything and I felt great about it. (laughs) But yeah, dancing every day is really, really, it's truly medicine. It is, isn't it? I go back to Cape Franklin again. It's church, isn't it? Or or temple or yeah. sanctuary. It is. And like, I've been having such funny things happening in my body, which could just be, you know, <laughs> the pause. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I think also it was just the fact that I wasn't moving things through my body, like my thoughts, mm-hmm. stagnant, chi, blood properly, whatever, right? So there's just something about the moving it through that I, like, I actually feel well in a way that I haven't in a long time and how quickly, like it was literally one full week of teaching every day. And I make sure I dance most of the class. Like I just, nice. it's, it's important to me. I'm just going to do it. Um, all these weird things that were happening in my body, like literally disappeared. Isn't that incredible? So whether it's psychic or emotional or intellectual uh, or physical, and probably all of those things wound together because we cannot cleave those things apart. That's working for me. Oh. Also the jade roller. Like, I just love that jade roller. That sounds so shallow, but man, do I ever love massaging my face every night? (laughs) Hey, it's all about like moving the chi. It's all about moving the chi. I got to get one of those. I don't know if I would do it right. And do you know what I was doing before is I was putting it in the freezer like 10 minutes before I used it. And then Frank was like, Kate, we talk about Kate Franklin a lot. And Kate was like, I just leave mine in the freezer. And now I'm doing that. Oh. Oh, delightful. Okay. If you have one and Kate has one, I'm getting one. <laughs> totally getting one. My guess is Allie also has one, the formidable Allie Denim Pilates switch mm. of the universe. Yes. You know, I often say to myself, what would Allie Denim do? Right? W-A-D-D. Yeah. W-A-D-D. I'm, I'm all um, W-K-F. I'm very bad at initials because I'm a little... W-W-K-F-D. I'm a little <laughs> dyslexic. So it, they kind of like... <laughs> but um, yeah. We have such ex- we have yeah. extraordinary friends. We do. But what's working for me is I have Kate Franklin telling me what to do. The best thing ever. Oh yeah, that's great. Best thing ever. She just tells me what to do. And then I have to like report back to her. It makes me very happy because at this point in one's life, you know, managing and telling people what to do and trying to figure things out and get the money to figure things out. Blah, 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 blah. Just a little bit of somebody else saying, you need to rehearse this piece this long on this day. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Oh man. I love being told what to do. I mean, I don't think I would have said that my whole life, but at this point in my life, for sure. I mean, I was just working with those 605 lovelies. I know. They're like, do this now. I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Mm. Lovely. Love it. Another time in my life, I would have been like, why is everybody telling you what to do? But I don't feel like that anymore. (laughs) All in good time in balance. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Steen Stein. Oh, thank you. I love talking to you, Tara. Always, always. I love talking to you and so many good things. So many good things. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Justine, for sitting down and talking to me about such fascinating things. Please get in touch. Instagram, Tara Cheyenne, TCP. Facebook, Tara Cheyenne Performance, and you can email, who knew, info at TaraCheyenne.com. Talking Shit with Tara Cheyenne is a project of Tara Cheyenne Performance. This podcast is produced, edited, and original music by Mark Stewart. You can get in touch at MarkStewartMusic.com. And one last reminder to donate if you have the means and inclination. TaraCheyenne.com, upper right-hand corner. Click Donate. 
The link will be in the show notes. And do check out our Instagram, Tara Cheyenne TCP. We've got some great initiatives coming up, including every Thursday, West Coast time, 9.30 to 10.30, Cafecito, which is an open creative process to get you invigorated and get those little follicles of creation vibrating. (laughs) To quote James Clear, the author of Atomic Habits, quote, The more you create, the more powerful you become. The more you consume, the more powerful others become. Mm. Think on that. Keep making shit up. We'll see you next time. This podcast is effing good. good.